Prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 26. And uh, reading from verse 9. The prophecy of Isaiah, which is just about halfway through your Bibles. And uh, chapter 26. Uh, reading at verse 9. Let's hear uh, God's word. With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let grace or favor be shown to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness he will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of God. Lord, when your hand is lifted up, they will not see. But they will see and be ashamed for their envy of people. Yes, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. Lord, you will establish peace for us, for you have also done all our works in us. O Lord, our God, masters besides you have had dominion over us, but by you only we make mention of your name. They are dead, they will not live, they are deceased, they will not rise. Therefore you have punished and destroyed them, and made all their memory to perish. You have increased the nation, O Lord, you have increased the nation, You are glorified. You have expanded all the borders of the land. Lord, in trouble they have visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening was upon them. As a woman with child is in pain and cries out in her pangs when she draws near the time of her delivery. So have we been in your sight, O Lord. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. May the Lord again bless the reading of his word to us, and I want with you to hear God's word as he speaks through us, particularly through verse 20. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut the doors behind you. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Now, this call to enter your chambers is a call addressed to the Lord's people. It's something you are to do, and it's something you're to do when God's judgment is let loose. And that's clearly the context of the words here. In fact, if you look at the wider context, you'll see that it is a context of God's judgment. It's dominated the previous several chapters in the prophecy of Isaiah. Most of the judgments there are actually addressed to different nations because Isaiah, like Jeremiah and some of the other prophets, were specifically prophets to the nations. And uh, God specifies that in connection with Jeremiah, that when he calls him to the prophetic ministry, I have called you, he says, from the womb to be a prophet to the nations. And that 
doesn't just mean that they prophesied about nations, but that they addressed their prophecies to the nations. And because many of these prophets moved in the courts of the kings, these prophecies would have been sent to the rulers, uh, to the governments of these nations to whom they prophesied. So, for example, in chapter 13, there is an oracle delivered against Babylon. In chapter 14, there's an oracle against Assyria and Philistia, the land of the Philistines. In chapter 15, there's an oracle against Moab, and so on, including Egypt and Assyria. But then in chapter 24, just before this, uh, the prophet moves away from specific national judgments to an international judgment. It is a judgment of God upon the earth. Isaiah 24, verse 1. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste. And this judgment takes with it the people, the priest, the servant, the master, the maid, the mistress, the buyer, the seller, the lender, the borrower, the creditor, and the debtor. The earth entirely emptied and plundered, for the Lord has spoken. Now, I am conscious that many people take the word earth here uh, to mean the word land, which it sometimes can do in the Hebrew, and we need to be careful whether something is being addressed to the earth or to the land of Israel. But I don't think this is addressed to the land of Israel at all, but literally to the earth. My primary reason for that is because of verse 4 in chapter 24, that is, where we're told that the earth mourns and fades away, the world languishes and fades away. And the word here translated world means the inhabited earth, the centers of populations, villages, towns, and cities. So I think that clinches it for us, that from chapter 24 onwards, what we have is an international judgment. And of course, It is a very severe judgment. You would expect any international judgment to be severe. And in that chapter 24, we're told that this judgment is cataclysmic. In verse 19, the earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly and shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. Now that, of course, is picturesque, poetic language. What you have is international convulsion and confusion. And what I really want you to notice, particularly this morning, is that the cities are destroyed so much that every house is shut up so that no one can go out and in. If you look at that chapter 24, and it's just necessary to stick in chapter 24 for a little while to set the context here. In chapter 24 and verse 10, We're told that the city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none may go in. That's internationally. Internationally, every house is shut up so that none may go in. And what's more, in the following verse, verse 11, we're told that there's a cry for wine in the streets, that joy is darkened, and the mirth or the amusement or the happiness of the land is gone, and desolation is left behind. There are no celebrations or parties in the cities. Amazingly, at an international level, everyone is suddenly confined at home. Now, the parallel with our own situation is quite astonishing, really. This particular judgment God has unleashed on the nations, collectively, has had the same effect. We are shut in. There's no voice of joy, mirth, or amusement in the land. Interestingly, I thought of this the other day when the Prime Minister exempted funerals. Uh, The house of feasting has been silenced, but the house of mourning is still open. A significant thing when we remember, really, that As the preacher tells us in Ecclesiastes, that it is far better for us to be in the house of mourning than in the house of feasting, because in the house of mourning, we consider. In other words, we consider nothing very much in the house of feasting, but there's something about mourning 
There's something about judgment, something about its solemnity that makes us stop, consider, and think about the situation. The, the reason for this judgment in Isaiah, the reason for the international judgment, was because the earth was defiled. Because there was a transgression of law, and the people had changed ordinances and broken the everlasting covenant. That's Isaiah 24, 5 again. Quite remarkable. People had defiled the earth, transgressed laws, changed ordinances. These are fixed, immovable things, and broken the everlasting covenant, which many take to be a reference to the covenant that God made with the earth, signified by the rainbow. In other words, the international judgment in Isaiah here was caused by what we were mentioning last week, an extraordinary provocation of God. Now, there is a difference between what I would call an ordinary provocation of God and an extraordinary provocation of God. There are ordinary provocations of God going on all the time, and God in his great grace and forbearance bears with them. He'll judge them all. He can judge some of them presently in his own time and in his own often hidden ways. He'll judge them all eventually, these ordinary provocations. By calling them ordinary, I don't mean to make them small. But extraordinary provocation brings extraordinary judgments, which God lets loose in time. We saw that last week, how in the reign of Ahab, Israel provoked God to an extraordinary degree and sinned against him with a a defiant high hand. And of course, a similar thing has happened now, internationally, particularly in the West, where this has taken so much hold. Just recently, the natural order of things has changed. You remember in Romans 1 how man changing the natural use of man changing the natural use of woman as female, brought a special judgment of God? Well, that's happened now. The natural ordinance of man as the image of God in both male and female, that is being disturbed, challenged, more than that, defiantly overthrown. I spoke of last week of how the sign of the covenant, the rainbow, is being taken and appropriated by people who are overthrowing the very ordinances that God has put in place for a continuity of life in happiness and holiness. And really, short of something like a nuclear war, it's hard to see what else could have shut down the world's capitals in such a way that people have all been confined to home. Think about it for a moment. There's a way in which we get used to everything, but think about it for a moment. Think about people in London confined to home. Think about people in New York confined to home. Think about people in Berlin confined to home. What would have done that? What would have accomplished that, you'd have thought, short of a nuclear war? But the fact is that God has done it. And in the context of this international judgment from God through a microorganism, God is calling his people into their own chambers. Now, if as Christians we hear God's judgment in this virus, and you can't but, so we need to hear his voice calling us into our chambers during that judgment. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut the doors behind you. Now, the primary idea here, and maybe the obvious idea, is the idea of taking refuge or trusting in God as a refuge. And you well know that God is often described as the refuge of his people. We often sing Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength. In Proverbs, we're told that the name of the Lord is a strong tower The righteous runs into it and are safe. Or again, Psalm 91, I of the Lord my God will say, he is my refuge still. In that sense, of course, everyone is called to enter that chamber. 
it's not just a call to my people, it's a call to everybody. Whether you're converted or not converted, you come and enter your chambers in the sense that you take refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only shelter from the storm of God's judgment. Um, in that sense, the chambers here function pretty much like the houses of the Israelites in the Passover. God unleashed a judgment uh, throughout Israel, sorry, throughout Egypt, throughout the whole land, um, a succession of plagues. You'll notice, of course, that uh, these plagues sadly, sadly hardened the people's hearts. Well, plagues didn't do that. The, their own hearts did it, but God in judgment hardened their hearts, hearts that the people had hardened themselves. That's the way it always works. God hardens what you harden yourself. But instead of the plagues softening the people, instead of the plagues bringing them to uh, reflection and repentance, it, it just hardened their hearts. I hope and pray that that is not the effect of the coronavirus, but only time will tell. If God takes his hand off us, this hand of chastisement, and people are as they were before, or people are even worse, well, that will be just the way it was in Egypt. It's strange how the intensity of the plagues moved them to cry for relief, but when they got the relief, they forgot God. And they quickly went back to life in Egypt as was. But here, coming into your chambers, would symbolize the homes of the Israelites. God told the Israelites to enter their houses. And God, of course, told them to put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts and on the lintel. And God passed over. In the Passover, he passed over the houses of Israel. The same verb, actually, as you have in the Hebrew here in verse 20. Hide yourself. Come, my people, enter your chambers. Shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a moment until the indignation is past. The same Hebrew verb. As though the indignation was scourging its way through the nation or scourging its way internationally. And while it was passing through the lands, the Lord's people were to find refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, of course, in that sense, we are all to flee to Christ the refuge. And in that sense, shutting the door behind us would be a way of saying to make sure you are in him and to make sure of your safety. Because if the indignation passing through the land, if the pestilence and the scourge, if it represents the judgment of God, then you've got to make sure that it doesn't access you. Cover yourself. Be completely confined, completely secure, you and Christ in the home. And uh, certainly, finding refuge in Christ will become the dominant theme of chapter 28, but that belongs to another time. So coming and entering our chambers, shutting our doors behind us, certainly means finding refuge in Christ. But having said that, I don't think that by any means exhausts the meaning of our text. In fact, I don't think it really gets near where our text wants to take us. Normally, when God is the refuge, it is his building, his tower, not ours. I think the only exception to that is the one that I just mentioned, actually, where uh, the refuge that God provided was in the individual houses of the Israelites. But normally in the scriptures, the refuge is God's provision. And in fact, in the rest of the book of Isaiah, there are several references to God being a refuge through a building that he has provided. Um, just as I quoted there in Proverbs earlier, the name of the Lord is a strong tower which he has built, which he is himself. The righteous runs into it and he is saved. But I want you to notice a subtle point too. You'll notice that the place of refuge here that we're being called into is not our home, but our chamber. Come, my people, enter your chambers. Now, in the Hebrew, this word is very distinctive. It means 
a private room or an inner room. I think you could even translate it just bedroom. The key to it is a place where you are on your own. It's private, secret place. A place where we are alone with God. And significantly, when the Jewish people translated the Old Testament into Greek, the word that they used in the Greek language was a word that we translate as closet in the New Testament. It's the very Greek word that Christ uses when he gives his lesson on prayer. Now, I'm sure you'll know that lesson on prayer. You'll remember that Christ told us to go into our closets and shut our doors. The expression is so similar to this. Come, my people, enter your closets and shut your doors behind you and hide yourself until the indignation is past. In other words, the idea is emerging here that this chamber is not just a place of refuge, but a place of communion, a place of fellowship, or more particularly, a place of prayer. Now, the link between refuge and prayer uh, shouldn't really be a surprise to us. I mean, we, we just sang a moment ago that God will be a refuge for the oppressed. And in the same thought, we're told that God has not forsaken them that truly seek his face. So when we come to the Lord as a refuge, we are coming to seek him and to seek him out, to seek him in prayer. And what's really important here in our text and in our context in Isaiah 26 is that this idea of prayer is very much present in the passage. And uh, I hope you have your Bible open anyway, but we're in chapter 26 in Isaiah. Our text is verse 20, come and enter your chambers. The idea is prayer. And look at verse 9. I'll come back to this in a minute. But in verse 9, notice what's said here. With my soul, I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me, I will seek you early. For, or because, I will seek you because when your judgments are in the earth, in the land, international judgments, the inhabitants of the world, not just of the Israel, but the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Notice that's why he's in prayer. Because when your judgments are in the land, in the earth, sorry, the inhabitants of the earth will learn righteousness. And this is the interesting thing, you see, because although it was the situation of judgment that everybody was shut up in their homes, we saw that already in Isaiah 24, 10, everyone was shut up indoors because of the scourge, yet Christians are called into their chambers by that providence. So the providence which actually puts everyone home is a providence that calls Christians not just into their homes, but into their secret places. Brethren and sisters, in other words, God is calling us here to prayer and to prayer for others. And that's no surprise too, primarily because until the final judgment comes, God's judgments are actually mercies. They are mercies. And this forced curfew, this forcing of God into your house should force you to your secret place to pray and especially to intercede. I don't know if intercession is a word that we're all familiar with in terms of its meaning, but the meaning of the word intercede is to stand between. And it means to stand between others and God. That's what God wants you to do. Christ, of course, intercedes for us because he stands between us and God. 
But God calls on you as a Christian to stand between God and others. What a position of privilege that is. What a position of honor. What a position of responsibility. What a position of, if it's not an abuse of the word, what a position of power that he calls you to stand in between. Far more important than we realize. And there's two reasons for that. First of all, the intercessor averts God's wrath. And if you are in your chamber, you can avert the wrath of God. Isn't that a thought? Isaiah tells us later in 59th chapter, I think, when sin abounded, he says, God wondered that there was no intercessor. Now, these are astonishing words. In, in different ways, they're astonishing words. Chapter 59 describes a long catalogue of sins that have overtaken the nation. And then we're told that God wondered. Well, first of all, we're told that God saw it. You know, it speaks about lying, dishonor, transgressing, iniquities multiplied, no truth, no justice in the streets, everything. And then suddenly it says the Lord saw it. It's important to recognize that God sees it. And it displeased him that there was no justice. Displeased God. But then he saw that there was no man. Verse 16. What does he mean by that? No man? Well, he wondered that there was no intercessor. He wondered that there was no intercessor. The result of that is that God actually clothed himself with vengeance and went out with judgment. The connection is simply this, that God unleashed his judgment because there was no effective intercession. Think about that for a minute in connection with the judgments of God. An international judgment poured out because there was no intercessor. You find the same thing in Ezekiel, in the passage that we read together. When again it describes the evil, God says, So I looked for a man who would make a wall. Now that wall there is obviously just a wall of protection. Uh, you'll remember when God says, I will be a wall about her and a fire in her midst, or the glory in her midst. I would look, uh, I looked for a man who would make a wall, a protective wall. I looked for a man who would stand in the gap before me. In other words, who would stand as an intercessor on behalf of the land. But I found no one, he says. And the next verse says, therefore I have poured out my indignation upon them. The same thought exactly. Before God unleashes the vial of his wrath, before he unleashes an international microorganism, he looks around for an intercessor and he finds no one. Intercessions do prevent God's judgments. Uh, we're familiar with some examples in the Old Testament. You'll remember how Moses averted the wrath of God. When Israel had worshipped the golden calf, he stood in the gap. God tested him as to his motive, that he would make a great nation of him, just as he made a nation of Abraham. And Moses was not interested in that. He was interested in the people. David also, when uh, the chastisement of God was upon Jerusalem and 75,000 or so, I'm not sure of that number, but 75,000 perished in the plague, he prayed for God to stay his hand, and God did stay his hand. That's what intercession is for. And we need to pray that in God's time he would lift this wrath off the land. Because intercession doesn't just prevent the plague, it removes the plague. Notice that. It doesn't just prevent, it removes. Will God ever take this away without intercession? The Second thing that intercession does is it, it doesn't just avert God's wrath, but it teaches us God's ways. It teaches the world God's ways. Now, how do we understand that? Uh, how on earth you say does intercession 
teach the world God's ways? Well, it does indirectly, but still very powerfully. In verse 9, I drew your attention to this verse earlier on. Read it again with me. Isaiah 26, verse 9. With my soul I have desired you in the night. By my spirit within me I will seek you early, for when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Now here's a man in his closet. Here's a man in his chamber. Here's a man in his secret place. And he's recognizing that the judgment that's going on around him has, as part of its purpose, to teach the inhabitants of the world the righteousness of God. That's what I meant earlier when I said that God's judgments are his mercies. You know, if God removes this curse, suppose another hundred thousand die. If God removes this scourge from our own land, if if this nation learns again the righteousness of God, if it's established in government, established in schools, established in universities, established in the law courts, if it's established in town councils, in county councils, then we will say, and of course in homes and families, we will say it was good for us that we were afflicted. Before we were afflicted, we went astray, but now we keep thy law. The inhabitants, when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Therefore, I pray, I desire you in the night, and my spirit within me seeks you early. And that's so important in our context, because as I said last Sabbath, while it's good and right for us to pray for the removal of this scourge, it is far more important to pray that it would be blessed. And here the Holy Spirit is linking a conversion in the world, or a reformation at least in the world. It's linking that. The Spirit is linking that conversion to the judgment of God. And how often we see that. I mean, how how infrequently do people turn to the Lord in plenty? And in fact, verse 10 goes on to show that. Um, Let grace... The word here means favor. Let favor be shown to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In other words, if if God is good to him, he, he doesn't learn righteousness from that. Um, even in the land of uprightness, he will still deal unjustly and he will not behold the majesty of God. In other words, while things are going swimmingly well with people, it doesn't really matter what prevails around them. They have no reason for self-reflection. They have no reason to go into their chambers, no reason to think about life or death or anything like that. Why? Because everything's fine. And that's why God's common messenger of mercy is affliction. That's the preacher he sends most often to bring salvation to a soul. Affliction. To bring us low. And to destroy pride. Because it's always the case that except we become as little children, we shall in no wise enter the kingdom of God. And a little child is distinguished by the absence of pride. Affliction does what favor doesn't. So therefore, when God is calling you now into your chamber, while the indignation is passing through the land, you pray in your chamber, that in these judgments, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So intercession averts wrath and it brings blessing. But for this to be so, I think it's only right to say that the intercession needs to be of a certain kind. First of all, it has to be sincere. It has to be sincere. By that I mean that it's got to rise out of a genuine concern for the souls that you're praying for. And it's got to have in view the glory of God too. A concern for the ones you're interceding for. And a concern for the glory of God. In connection with that, I want you to notice that there are two kinds of prayer in this chapter. I don't know if you noticed that during the reading, but there's a, a prayer that produces wind, and there's a prayer that produces life. 
In verse 16, we have a false kind of prayer. This is people who who visit God in trouble. Lord, in trouble they have visited you. They poured out a prayer when your chastening, chastening was upon them. As a woman with child is in pain and cries out in her pangs when she draws near the time of her delivery. Now, these are, these are the emergency prayers that people often put up. Um, you put them up in your hospital bed. Oh, Lord, spare my life. And if I get out of this hospital, I'll, I'll be a different person. Or a prayer that comes out of financial ruin. You know, if you, if you deliver me from this financial ruin or the, the thought of, of losing my house or, or losing my savings, I, I'll, certainly, I'll certainly serve you. The, these kind of emergency prayers are so often accompanied with promises and resolutions. But you'll notice that nothing happened. Verse 18, we have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. Not child, but just wind. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. That's in humility before the Lord. We prayed. It's not just that other people prayed, but we prayed and we accomplished nothing. Nothing. Now, when we pray and nothing happens, It's certainly a call to faith and it's a call to cling on, but sometimes it's also a call to examine ourselves, to see if our prayers are true. Are they real? Do we genuinely care for the world? Do we care for the perishing people? Do we care for the glory of God to be manifest on the earth? Are we really praying? Or are we asking amiss? that we might squander everything upon our own lusts. I think if you were to examine the subtle ways in which prayer life just terminates upon self, you might be aghast. Let your prayer be sincere. I mentioned a moment ago how David was pained at the suffering of his people and how Moses was awestruck at the thought that the people would perish. That's an intercessor. So as well as being sincere, our intercession in our chamber should also be earnest. Look again at verse 9. We already saw the connection in this verse, but I want you to pay attention to the kind of prayer that he offers. With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. We get the impression this man was always like that. But he's especially like that when the judgments of God are abroad in the land. He is desiring God in the night. And by his spirit, he is seeking him early. Now, the word early can sometimes mean uh, eagerly or um, enthusiastically or something like that. But I don't think it carries that meaning there. Or if it does, it's only in a subordinate sense. I think the meaning here is actually early. The the idea is the morning. In other words, you have a parallel idea here. With my soul, I have desired you in the night, and by my spirit, I will desire you early. This is earnest, closet prayer. This is a man, a woman, who has learned to pray in the secret place diligently, regularly, praying without ceasing. Taking hold of God morning, taking hold of God evening, regular, disciplined prayer. Now, when God wondered that there was no intercessor, I wonder if this is what God meant. It's not that people weren't praying. It's not even that there wasn't a measure of sincerity about these prayers. It's just that people weren't taking hold of God. Notice this earnestness, with my soul I have desired you in the night. There's no no sense of routine there. There's no sense of going through emotion of some kind. By my spirit within me, I will seek you early, because when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Were we interceding 
to prevent a judgment? It doesn't look like it. In the middle of the judgment, are we interceding now? Is the Lord looking in the midst of the coronavirus internationally and still wondering that there are no intercessors? Come, my people, and enter your secret place and shut your doors behind you. Last of all, just very briefly, I want you to notice the result of this intercessory prayer. Now, I admit here it's not clear, and I'm not going to be dogmatic about about the meaning of this, but I feel persuaded myself that the reference in verse 19 is to the result of this intercession. Verse 19, your dead shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. You'll notice that that promise, uh, which seems vague anyway on the face of it, but you'll notice that it follows the idea of a fruitless prayer. Um, Verse 18, we have been with child, we have been in pain, we have as it were brought forth wind, we have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, no result, nothing coming from our prayers, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. But then in verse 19 here, there's a sudden change of emphasis. This is a prayer certainly that's performing miracles. This is what happens when souls desire him in the night and when spirits seek him early. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. I think there's a reference to the second resurrection there as well as the first. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. So come, my people, and enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. The promise really as I see it, is that real intercession in the chambers, in the midst of God's judgments, awakens the dead. It awakens the dead in trespasses and sins. I mean, is that you? Are you not just experiencing the effect of this international judgment, but are you conscious in your own soul that the judgment of God has been upon you? Have you been conscious through life recently that that God is speaking to you about your soul not being right with God? Has the judgment of God come upon your life, come upon your home? I don't see that in any kind of proud or arrogant way. The same judgment of God can deal with myself and has done. But is it upon you? You need to awaken. And you need to awaken ultimately to everlasting righteousness. Your dead shall live. And this resurrection life of verse 19 which takes place in your soul, will take place at the last day too, together with my dead body, they shall arise. In other words, the eternal life that you have is so living and so real that it will break through the last judgment of death itself and you will arise and awaken and you will sing, you who dwell dead in the dust. So let me just close by uh, saying this, that God has unleashed a judgment which has shut us all in chapter 24 verse 10 but you as a christian have not been shut in by that judgment god has called you in it's not the government that's confined you at home right now it's god he's called you into your home and into your chamber That's where he wants you to be. And in that chamber, you might just not avert the judgment of God, but you might awaken the dead. Is that not an encouragement to intercede? That the dead might be awoken in your home, in your congregation, in your nation and in the world. That's what an intercessor is. Let's say close our service by singing um, again from God's own word in the very well-known words of Psalm 46. Again in the combined um, psalm book, that's on page 271. Psalm 46. The opening verses, which we sing most often, 
uh, picture international convulsions and the security of God's city where God himself reigns. The Lord will always help his own city. So the heathen are raging tumultuously in verse 6, and the kingdoms are agitated, they are moved. But then the Lord God utters his voice, and the earth melts for fear. Now in verse 7 it says, and this is the chorus, that the Lord of hosts upon our side doth constantly remain. And how important it is to remember this, friends, in in all these convulsions, that God is with us. The God of Jacob's own refuge us safely to maintain. Now, when we're told to look at what God is doing here internationally, he says, come and behold what wondrous works have by the Lord been wrought. Come see what desolations he on the earth hath brought. Now, that seems to have a kind of negative turn, as though God is destroying things. But you'll notice that the destruction God brings is with a view to to good, because he says in verse 9, unto the ends of all the earth, wars into peace he turns. The bow he breaks, that's the, the warrior's bow, he breaks it, it's finished. The spear he cuts, in fire the chariot burns. It's the, the instruments of war are being got rid of. And because God does this, be still, all of us, all of you, be still in the judgment. And know that I am God. The result of his work is that among the heathen I will be exalted. I on earth will be exalted high. Our God, who is the Lord of hosts, is still upon our side. The God of Jacob, our refuge, forever will abide. Uh, Verses 8 to 11, then, to God's praise. Come and be and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.